punishment. As we talked about before, in most of the most teaching uh, settings in regards to revelation, certainly much of non Christianity. The book of Revelation isn't something that is uh, promoted very well. It's something that most, most teachers and even uh, in, uh, teachers ministries would say the average Christian like ourselves, we're not really able to understand what revelation is. It's just on a great confusion. Uh, we have to interpret the form, so here's what we're going to do, and, and which is fine, because taken it, it by itself, it is difficult to, to analyze. So what they've done is instead of trying to work on the form, so work on something that would make the book of Revelation more understandable and palatable, they basically said, let us define the theme, and we'll give you an outline of what we're going to do the book of Revelation. And what we're going to see tonight is that tonight we look at this as we go along, is that there are four different ways, primarily four different ways of interpreting the book of Revelation. And each, each school of thought, uh, you know, in Christianity as it relates to the book of Revelation, will adhere to one of those four systems, one of those four ways of interpreting the book of Revelation. We're going to dig deep into this, particularly in the futuristic view or the futuristic treatment of the book of Revelation. That one in particular, we will have to spend a lot of time on. Uh, and that's the one that most of the evangelical Christianity uh, would, would, adhere, would apply in regards to interpretation. Now, we're in, a, we're in a, a, a strange and unusual place in the Christian landscape as it relates to prophecy. Because the modern evangelical church does not consider the cross at all. In fact, they come the other way. Because you don't promote the message that's being promoted now in the end of the modern uh, If you're teaching the book of religion, you can't. they're not conducive, they're not, they're not mutually conducive. Because modern Christianity has chosen to, 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 to pay its way with the message of grace. Which is wonderful, you all have grace. But their interpretation of grace is that you should never focus on anything that has any sense of negativity. Uh, only on what is good, what is great, what is pertaining to God's grace only. So the idea of judgment, accountability, responsibility toward God is not, it's not something that fits into that message that we're getting, that we're getting in modern Christianity. Unfortunately, that's what the church is. How did the church get to this place? Anybody can have this. How did the church devolve into the position that it's in today? Now, not all of the church, okay? So the, the, over, the overwhelming uh, front march of Christianity today is in this direction, where modern Christianity, or post modern Christianity, is, is prevalent. How did we get to such a place? Uh, local pastors in this country, even local pastors, 
at Pentecostal and otherwise, began to converge and they determined that the times when we put by the prophecy of the most outlined by the Christians behind us and prepare for the new millennium. And open up and walk well to the way for unbelief. Because we're not preaching that by the prophecy. We ought to we ought to open up and so we can invite the masses in and be more be more be more kind and gentle. How did that come to be? Well, it really started in the mid nineteen eighties. When eschatology was at its peak, Bible prophecy, uh, the Bible prophecy movement, eschatology was at its peak in the 1980s. It had stayed there for about three decades, but after the Six Day War, the Six Day War, after the formation of the State of Israel, uh, Bible prophecy teachers really took off. That, that developed even more so with the Six Day War, and then you had the Portal Turn of the War, the Beyond the Portal War. All these wars of Israel, all these conflicts in Israel, build strongly a defensive situation that the time of the society coming with me. And this is the way this is. And this is the way this is. And then, in the mid 1980s, a certain Bible teacher, a prophecy teacher, came out and said that Jesus is coming in 1988. And this really took off. It swept across the evangelical church. And a good percentage of Christians walk into it. The other percentage is to say, well, that will be good to come. And, and so by the time 1988 came along, there was a lot of excitement. How many of you remember that? But I've, I've heard from people who went there, my son and other people who went to this church, and and even, even my son, who is open to, to anything new, he's 21, 22 years old, said he couldn't handle it. The entire space is black. Even the ceiling is black. The music is very loud, very driving, uh, very emotional, powerful, uh, captures your spirit as you come in, the music does. And the message is very grace-focused, grace-oriented. That is the model of modern Christianity, folks. That's the church that's selling today. That's the church movement that's shutting down little churches like, like this one and many others. and drawing, it's, it's the corporate church model. That's, that's what it is. You, you remember the corporate model of the 1970s and 80s? Uh, a hardware store, been in existence for 40 years, moms and pops type operation, uh, would be completely overtaken and, and bought out by the, by the, by the corporate con, conglomerate type business, right? And that happened across the world. It happened in this country really, really intensely in the 1980s. Well, that corporate model of the juggernaut buying up the little guys and just swallowing up everyone has been, has been appropriated into Christianity. And it began with the emerging church movement. It was during the emerging church movement of the early 19th and uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 21st century, the first five years of the 21st century, that we began to see for the first time. Personally, I believe that the corporate model is the beast, the, 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 the world order model of doing things. That it's, it's spun, it's, 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 it's stemmed by the world order. I'm saying that the corporate model is demonic. And you really have to work in it for a considerable period of time to really appreciate what I'm saying, but it is. The way people react to it, the way people behave in its confines, it is definitely demonic. At any rate, so these churches now all became postmodern, corporate model, preaching a, a, a very patented message that really has very little to do with the Bible. The core essential message that they put out is about 10% Bible and 90% psychology and self-help. I mean, I'm not defaming them without good grounds. I am defaming them because they, it's shameful what they're doing. And they are omitting completely Bible prophecy. Now, Later on, we'll see in, in, in Revelation chapter 19, Jesus, well, the angel that was ministering to John said that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. 
So the, we'll see that in Revelation chapter 19, that the essence, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So you, you consider that statement. Then on top of that, you consider that much of the, much of the message of Jesus was eschatology. Much of it, a good maybe 30, 35% of what he spoke about, taught on, is Bible prophecy. And then he has this, and Jesus has this incredible revelation, and, and he shares this most, in, most important and profound revelation with us. So, the question is, as a Christian, a disciple of Jesus, is Bible prophecy important? <laughs> right? Now, that's why, that's why I'm so aggressive or so agitated with the modern church movement, because they've taken it upon themselves to step away from Bible prophecy as if it just doesn't matter, and even not only step away from it, but treat it with disdain. Treat it with actual disdain. In those, in those types of church settings, if someone was to inquire about Bible prophecy, there's a patented way with dealing with those people, which is to say to them, well, there's a small Bible prophecy class that's meeting on Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock. You can join them. And it's, those classes are really designed to discourage people. I get feedback. So you go to the mega church outlet type place, and I want to know about prophecy. Tell me about what you believe about prophecy. Well, we don't really teach that from the pulpit. Uh, come to this class, and we'll, that's what we do. You go to the class, and their endeavor is to discourage you in that class from considering Bible prophecy. It's a travesty. Now, there's good news. Good news is that Beyond the emerging church movement, there are small churches that have sustained and are ramping up its, their efforts at teaching Bible prophecy. And that's, that's, a, that's a very good development. It's positive, and, and it needs to happen even more. But for the emerging church setting, such as uh, Action Church and all the others, they will not turn to Bible prophecy. They will not. They certainly will not teach on the book of Revelation. Uh, the way that you're about to enter into the book of Revelation. All right, so all of that to say that, that it's a travesty that Christianity today has turned its back on Bible prophecy. Uh, Who is suffering as a result of this? The people, the believers. The believers are being lured into a sense of, of, of even complacency. Confusion, of course, but complacency about the words of Jesus, about the message of Jesus. Because so much of the message of Jesus is, in fact, Bible prophecy. So what, 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 are, we end, what, what, are, we, what are we going to end up with eventually if this continues? Well, they, they're going to treat Jesus like Buddha. Just focus on the nice things he said or the things we can interpret to be, to be uh, applicable to our lives that we enjoy and not focus on the rest that he said. So we will not focus on the overall message of Jesus, will focus on the things that he said in little bites. A little bite here, a little bite there, you know, and that's how, that's, that's what they do. And so this is, a, this is unfortunate. Now, the book of Revelation captures, I think, almost completely the essence of Bible prophecy. Not complete, because we also have the other prophets. Now, in regards to the book of Revelation, Israel is not emphasized as much as in the prophets, the minor and the major prophets. All right, Israel is a part of this of, of this this revelation, but you see, from the standpoint of John, from the standpoint of Yeshua, Israel was a very important part of everything put into the kingdom of God. Israel was the centerpiece of everything. So Israel's importance relative to the book of Revelation was a given. It was obvious to them. It's not obvious to us today when we study the book of Revelation because we're studying the book of Revelation from the perspective and the context of being Gentiles. And looking into the book of Revelation with a Gentile mindset, then you, you don't recognize Israel and the whole, and the whole uh, play out of the book of Revelation. Now, if you, look, if, you, if, we, if you enter into the book of Revelation with the proper mindset for believers, which is that we're grafted into Israel, and we see, we see things the way 
God wants us to see them relative to Israel because we're grafted into Israel. If we have that perspective and turn into the book of Revelation, we'll see things that you would not normally see if you did not have that perspective. Right? Okay. So I said a lot there and uh, maybe a little too much. So we said last week that the book of Revelation can be divided into three categories, right? The things which were, the things which are, and the things which is to come. Future events. And so let's get right into this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and looking at this, it, you know, the first time I did this, I, I had the whiteboard in, the, in building one, our first building, and this showed up real nicely. It's not showing up real nicely here. Can everyone see it anyway? I, I wish I had a different color scheme, but on the whiteboard, it, it's, it's nice. I like it. By the way, this color here is supposed to be purple. Um, I'm not sure what it looks like there. Anyway, what does it look like? A little lavender. Lavender-ish. But it's supposed to be purple. All right, let's move on. All right, so the three essential divisions of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, just for... Ooh, comes to an abrupt end there. I hope that doesn't affect us too badly. I wonder how I can get this to move back this way. Something to do with the, with the projector. We'll see if I need it. So someone, if you would, just for the sake of uh, recapping, read for us Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, please. Anyone? All right. So that's the verse that puts the entire book of Revelation in perspective as we approach it to study it, right? So the things which you have seen, and this is from John's place and time, not from our, not from our time perspective, and this is important. So from John's position and time, what did he see? The seven golden lampstands, all right, which represented the light that were in the seven churches in Asia Minor. We talked about this. I think we did, yes. The seven golden lampstands, seven stars in Jesus' right hand. These are the seven churches. Now, it's not saying that there were only seven illuminated churches. These are the seven churches that John had interaction with. You follow me? So John was an apostle more than likely he had direct interaction with these seven churches. Jesus came to him in regards to these seven churches. Most scholars tend to believe that. I tend to agree with them. There are times when I agree with the scholars. Nonetheless, so seven stars in Jesus' right hand. These are the seven churches. Now, a question. Seven menorahs or the seven lampstands are the light of the seven churches. The seven stars are actually... The, 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 the pastors, the, the, the angels. That needs a little bit of def definition. So the stars are not really the churches. The stars are the, 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 the angels of the seven churches. Now, we say, okay, does that, does, that, does that relate to us that every church has an angelic being that's associated with it? That's not what I'm saying. When you do, when you do a study in the Greek, the, 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 the word angel simply means messenger in Hebrew, right? Melach. And Jesus addresses the angels of the churches. The angels of the churches. So it's not, it's not an angelic being as, as a, a, a seraphim or, or, or nephilim, or not nephilim, seraphim or cherubim. It's referring to the messengers of the church. So we believe that the stars are the pastors of the seven churches. And they're in his right hand. So if you are involved in ministry, you have, you have comfort to know that if you are functioning in Messiah as his angel, his messenger, that you're in his right hand. Now, when we study the two chapters, two and three, how did Jesus treat the churches that were not up to par? How did he relate to the angels of those churches who were not up to par? He warned them. He warned them, right? 
So therein lies the reality that we should be in alignment with God's purpose as ministers, as, as quote-unquote angels, as pastors. In other words, your, your position before him as a pastor isn't guaranteed if you're not, particularly if you're not walking in obedience to him. But if you are, the idea is that you're in his right hand. What did he see also? The resurrected, glorified Messiah. So these, these are the things that he saw. The things which he saw. The seven golden lampstands, which are the seven churches. The seven stars or the seven messengers in Jesus' right hand. And the resurrected, glorified Messiah. The things which are. Right? So those are related to the seven messages, to the seven churches in Asia Minor, the things which will, excuse me, which will take place after these things is what we're going to begin to look at tonight. Okay, so these are the conditions that leads to the judgment seat of Messiah. The entire, the entire book of Revelation, from chapter 4 up to 19, all deals with what will occur at the judgment seat of Christ. There's a very small portion in the book of Revelation namely Revelation chapter 20 only, and only a part of chapter 20, that deals with what will lead up to the judgment seat of God himself. If that's confusing, hold on, I will define that as we go along. Certainly the judgment seat of Christ is the judgment seat, the judgment seat of God himself, but God is going to judge at that conflict that we call Armageddon through Messiah Jesus. Jesus will sit on a throne and he will judge this is the judgment seat of christ and again chapter 4 all the way up to chapter 19 is what leads up it's effectively the build-up to the judgment seat of christ conditions that lead to the judgment seat of god the father which of course is in revelation chapter 20 like i said basically let me let me let me spill the beans right now this here the judgment seat of christ is what we call the Armageddon. It's the Armageddon conflict. Now, right? this this is this is unveiled and disclosed fully in Revelation chapters thirteen to nineteen, but it's it's actually all of the chapters that are involved. So, Armageddon, and then this this here, which is a very small portion here in Revelation chapter twenty that relates to this is the Gog and Magog conflict. We've talked about this many times that the same Gog and Magog conflict that we see in, in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 is what John refers to in, Re in Revelation chapter 19. It's very vivid, right? You cannot convolute this, although many people uh, make a mess of this. I hate to say it that way, but they do. Because many people will put together or convolute the Armageddon conflict with the Gog and Magog conflict, and quite frankly, I cannot see how they do it. It's, it's so obvious. It's, it's so clear. I mean, it's, it's, I hate to say this, way, but it's elementary that the Armageddon conflict is not the Gog and Magog conflict. There's a thousand years between them. The book of Revelation just makes it so clear and obvious. And we'll see that. But many people tend to confuse this, this, this issue and they do it to their own confusion. To their own confusion. So, this here is Armageddon. This here is Gog and Magog. Every conflict, these two conflicts, uh, both conflicts uh, are going to be met with the judgment seat of God in Messiah and God himself. This is the outstanding uh, factor about the, the Gog and Magog conflict. The outstanding fact is that God himself will sit as judge in that conflict. This is when he brings all of creation to its end. All right, Isaiah saw it. He said, Behold, I make all things new, a new heaven and a new earth. All things have done, has been done away with, new things come into existence. That's the great white throne judgment. Then, of course, the new creation, the new Jerusalem and its temple, and this here is the way the book, of the, the book of Revelation is divided. So next week, I'll hand out these copies 
and you can have them for yourselves and you can take them home and you can keep reviewing them. All right, now let's get into the meat of the class. The four principal systems of interpretation of the book of Revelation. So I said just now that we have four ways. We don't, but there are effectively four systems, four models, however you want to say it, for interpreting the book of Revelation. And this is, this is what, this will cover, I think, 90% uh, 90, 90 of all Christianity. How many Christians are there in the world? 2.5 billion or something? 2.7 billion, I think, somewhere around there. So these four systems of interpretation will cover the belief system of 2.5 billion people, roughly. So I think the vast majority of the 2.5 billion people are unaware of what even the word prophecy means. I'm, I'm not trying to be cavalier. I'm just saying that that's a fact. Most Orthodox Christians who would say that they are Christians on, the, on, a, on a form that they would fill out are totally oblivious to what Bible prophecy is all about. I, I, it's just a fact. Many of them are not even acquainted with the Bible. They're, 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 they're taught to believe that the Bible isn't something that you even need to consider for your life. Just come to church, uh, go through the rigor of being a good, a good uh, Orthodox Christian and you're fine. All right? Now, for those of us that are given over to study, those of us who has the Holy Spirit and are pursuing revelation and understanding, these are, for us, we will look for ways to interpret the book of Revelation. All right? There are four ways that, I'm gonna, that we're going to talk about tonight. And the Zemach model for interpreting the book of Revelation is the historic system or the historic model which we'll talk about tonight. All right, so the first is the preterist view. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about each of them. I'm going, to, I'm going to run through the whole PowerPoint, and then I'll come back to this particular page on the PowerPoint. The preterist view, we'll come back to this. We'll talk about these. The spiritual allegorical view, We'll talk about these as well. The futuristic view, this is the most prevalent in our form of Christianity. In other words, here in the South, the Bible Belt, most believers in the Bible Belt here in the South uh, would adhere to the futuristic view. And many of us probably come from that place of seeing the book of Revelation from this point of view. So we'll come back and discuss this. That's a big discussion waiting for us. Now, this is where we will come down as Fellowship Church. This is where we will settle on Bible prophecy. The historical view, which we will come back in a little while and discuss this some more. Now, let's move on here. That's the end of it. No need to move on. Let's go right back. Preterists. All right. Let me get this back online here. Come on. All right. Come on. From beginning. All right. So, the first view we're going to talk about, or system model, is the preterist view. The preterist view completely, it states that the, the book of Revelation is completely fulfilled or was completely fulfilled in the first and second century AD. Now, what Christian movements would adhere to this preterist, preterist view? Any ideas? Who would adhere to the preterist view? No, not, not quite. Let me, say, let me say it this way. They would if it was convenient. But it, they would if it was convenient. But they do not. They have a different view altogether. We'll talk about that here in a moment. In fact, what the Roman Catholics believe, and now the Roman Catholic view can be divided into many, many different perspectives, all right? Not all Roman Catholics see, see uh, prophecy in the same light. Uh, many 
many, if not most of them, would just receive whatever the, the leadership of the Catholic movement that they're a part of would, would, uh, would afford for them to receive, which is the preterist view uh, combined with the, uh, the allegorical or spiritual view. That's where most Catholics will come down. Now, there are some Catholics that would adhere to the futuristic view, which is more evangelical than, than others. Mainly, the denominations that would adhere to this are like the Methodists, the Episcopalians, uh, you know, those types of denominational structures. They, they're Christian, for sure. They're not exactly evangelical. You know, the Presbyterians, for instance, are, are certainly preterists. But they're not the type of believer that will want to hear about Bible prophecy, hear about the, full, hear about the coming of Christ. Their position would be Christ has already come. He's in us, he's in the church, and we don't consider a future coming of Christ. The Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, the Methodists, and many of these types of denominations would adhere to the futurist, to the uh, preterist view. What does the word preterist mean? Someone look it up, look it up on your on your smart device. Preterist, I want to get a proper definition. I know what it means, but I want to get it from the internet. This is very prevalent, by the way. My son, Michael, went out and, for whatever reason, engaged uh, an Episcopalian, or maybe a Presbyterian, Presbyterian. And he got, the, he got the standard line, which is, Jesus, he's here. He's in the church. And we don't focus on, on, uh, on the coming of Jesus in the future. He, they said that's in the near future. And the, and the person actually said to my son, if you... If you focus on this too much, you get carried away with conspiracy theories and you go off into left field, right? You go off into eschatology land where, you know. So that's kind of where they are. This is safe for them, the preterist view. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a safety net almost. No actual relevancy to modern Christianity. The book of Revelation has no relevancy to where we are today. It was fulfilled in the first and second century, particularly when Israel was driven out into the nations. In other words, they take the position that all of, all of the book of Revelation had to do with what was coming upon Israel and what was coming upon the early believers. And it, it all came to a culmination in the second century AD, and so it's done. The book of Revelation is fulfilled. There's no need for us to look any further into the future. And therefore, it has no modern relevancy in today's Christianity. Yes, preterists? So thus we have the preterist view. And you might be surprised to know that that's the official position of the Anglicans, the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, and even the Methodists. Yes. Their standard reply to that is, oh, we know Jesus will come one day. <laughs> and, and they usually refer to some time in the distant, distant, distant future. They never, they never want to consider that we might be living in those times. They always say the book of Revelation is fulfilled. That's their position. And therefore, for us, we don't, we don't have any need. There's no relevancy for us to consider that today. That, that's their standard reply. In fact, if you go out to some of these churches, you will hear that from the pulpit whenever the pastor or the minister is challenged to talk about prophecy. They'll make that statement. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists are not there. They are not preterists. Of course, they are looking forward to the coming of Messiah. They adhere to the futuristic view of the book of Revelation. All right? Embraced by most Protestant orthodoxy. So, Protestant orthodoxy. Not traditional orthodoxy but Protestant orthodoxy. 
There are, there are some aspects of traditional orthodoxy that would also employ the, the preterist view. They would. It all depends on who's teaching, what professor at that particular institute is teaching, and so on. But by and large, the, 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 the conventional Orthodox Church does not adhere to the preterist view. And, and they do it mostly because it's not their tradition. <laughs> this is very much a Protestant idea, a Protestant compromise, actually. All right. Any questions about the preterist view? Any ideas, any thoughts, any discussion about the preterist view? With what? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, 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 replacement theology fits snugly into uh, the preterist view, meaning that in the first and second century, the book of Revelation was fulfilled, it's done, and Israel was dispersed and assimilated into the nations, no longer to ever be restored as a nation. They rejected Jesus, and now they are going to be completely done away with. And who replaces Israel? Of course, the church does. And, and so the preterist view becomes a habitation for, for uh, a place where replacement theology can, can infestate. And it does do that quite readily. So replacement theology fits in to every Christian movement. And every Christian ideology, every one of them, allows for replacement theology. All right, so the spiritual allegorical view takes a position that there's no literal, no literal fulfillment. Now think about this. What denominations today would adhere to this concept? You ever heard of the Unitarian Church? All right, the Unitarians... But that's an extreme branch of Christianity, right? You say, well, they're not even Christians, but they are. On paper, they are Christians. They would certainly embrace this. But don't, don't be surprised about your Presbyterians and your Episcopalians and your Methodists. Because the modern Methodists, Episcopalians, and Presbyterians are finding this very comfortable. They're finding that, that place of an allegorical spiritual fulfillment as a suitable place for them. In other words, these denominations are not settled on the book of Revelation. They have traditional views, and they have more modern, more currently developed views. And most of them today would say that, many of them, I should say, would say that there's no literal fulfillment. It's all allegorical, right? Allegorical, not in the sense that the Bible is brimming with allegorical pictures, all right? It's flowing with allegorical typologies everywhere. What they will do, and now there are none in the book of Revelation, <laughs> by the way, which is kind of ironic. The book of Genesis, almost every chapter, not almost, but not, not every chapter, but throughout the book of Genesis, there are at least 10 allegorical pictures in there. And they're profound, they're vivid, and they're powerful. The book of Genesis. The book of Revelation has none in reality, it does it, not even one allegorical picture. As as allegor, as allegor, as allegorical pictures are concerned, not even one. Why is that? Because the Book of Genesis, of course, it's a Torah, but the Book of Genesis is brimming with narratives, stories. I call them sagas. And in these narratives. God worked from the very beginning to establish greater pictures of what he will do in those stories. Well, there are no such stories in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a revelation given to Jesus to communicate to us. In many ways, the book of Revelation is partially fulfilled, fulfillment of allegorical pictures that were set in the Old Testament. So, from, you know, like, we know that symbolism and allegorical pictures are everywhere in the Bible, okay? Now, they all point to the New Testament. When you take the, the entire New Testament, looking for allegorical typologies and pictures, there are essentially none. 
Not like we find them, the book of Genesis, all the way to the book of Esther. Following the book of Esther, what book comes after the book of Esther? Job, right? The book of Job is, is an event that occurred in the life of Job. There's not much there that we can gleam from, for an allegorical picture. It's, but nothing real profound, not like the book of Esther. And not like all of the books prior to the book of Esther, which is effectively the Torah and the writings. The first five books of Moses and the writings up to, takes us up to, uh, to the book of Esther. And there are none in the book of Psalms for obvious reasons, right? They're just a bunch of songs. There are none in the prophets. Why? Because the prophets do not tell a story of individual lives that we can form and that God can form an allegorical picture of or for. They're only in the Torah and the writings. There are none in the, in, in, in the book of Revelation. Yet, the people that adhere to this says that it's only allegorical. Allegorical to what? What's it saying? If, if, it's, if it's just a book of allegorical pictures, or if it's just one big allegory, what is it saying? That God's a vicious God and he's going to come and bring damnation upon the world? Is that, and, and quite frankly, if you press the issue with them, that's where they, they, they end up. That's where they come to because they don't have an answer. What was it allegorical to? What is it pertinent to? And they don't really have an answer. This view, in my opinion, is the most ridiculous of them all. That you can take the entire book of Revelation and just spiritualize it and form allegorical pictures from it, and that suffices. In other words, you can do anything <laughs> with the book of Revelation. Whatever suits your, your fancy, do it. A compilation of allegorical lessons, which does not exist in the book of Revelation. I've looked at it myself, looking for allegorical pictures that relates to us or relates to whatever God is doing. They're not there. Embraced by liberal Christianity. Now tell me about liberal Christianity. Do, yes. Do a quick word search or, or Google search. Liberal Christianity. And, and look, for, look for the sex or the movements in liberal Christianity. Now we know that Christianity in the last 20 years, since the emergent church, look up emergent church. Uh, that's a good one. If, if you got a moment, please. Look up emergent church, liberal Christianity. In the last 20 years, liberal Christianity has expanded. I mean, considerably. Why? Because of the emergent church. Because of the emergent church, liberal Christianity has, ta has taken root. And the message of the liberal church, the message of the emergent church, is grace. That, that effectively, if, you've, if you're a Christian, and that's kind of ill-defined, <laughs> Because it used to be back in the 1970s and 80s, a Christian was someone who was born again. Remember the Jesus movement? People were being transformed and being born again. This is the way someone, someone would become a Christian, and this has been the way since the book of Acts. People were radically changed, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and that would define what a Christian is. Today it's different. If you go to church and you've made some confession, then you're a Christian. All right, and so today's Christians are being fed liberal theology throughout much of Christianity, and the grace message is appropriate. It's apropos, as the French say. Is that French? I think it is. It is appropriate for the, the, for the emerging church, the grace message. Why? Because it takes the position that there's no accountability for your actions. God is not going to hold you accountable for what you do. You've got grace. You're a Christian. You come to our church. You've made some confession of faith. You've been through a Bible class, something like a Bible class. So you're a Christian. You're in. That settles it. You have grace for all eternity. Right. So, so, so what if you, you, you're caught up in pornography? So what if you drink and get out of control from time to time? So what if you divorced your wife? and you've committed adultery, you have grace. 
Listen, that sounds absurd to us. You know why? Because we're Bible believers. It is not absurd in the Christian landscape today. It's not. Even in the church that was 20 years ago, evangelical, Bible believing. So what, what's a good, what, what you got for me? You know what I need? I need, I need a laptop here that's where I can just punch something in and, uh, and Google while I talk and it'll come right up on the wall. All right. And how does the emergent church fit into that? See, this, this is, this is, this is, I, I really have a beef with this particular context or this particular construct for Bible prophecy fulfillment. This, in my opinion, is the most odious, although, although the futuristic view is the most damaging. The most damaging. The one that I'm most concerned about is the futuristic view. The one that I despise the most is this. So there's a view, uh, a, a system of interpreting the book of Revelation that I'm really concerned about, the futuristic view. And there's one that I really don't like, which is this. I prefer that you be a preterist and not adhere to this. Because this tells you that basically... Our theology is all liberal, so we can embrace homosexuality. We can embrace gender neutrality. We can embrace abortion. We can engage in all these things, because after all, we have grace and we have mercy. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. The emergent church was an effort, came about in the early 2000s. It's about five years in the making. Uh, that was designed to begin to to water down the evangelical church. If you look at it from the grandest perspective, in other words, from Satan's viewpoint, what was Satan doing with the emergent church movement? He was watering down the believing church, and he succeeded. Yes. Church is a Christian Protestant movement of the late 20th and early 21st centuries that crosses a number of theological boundaries. Participants are variously described as Protestant, post Protestant, evangelical, post evangelical, liberal, post liberal, socially liberal, and Anabaptist, Reform, Charismatic. So the emergent church movement, one of the things that the, these leading pastors wanted to do in the early 90s, in the mid-1990s, by the way, some of our favorite pastors here in Orlando was very much involved in the emergent church movement. Yes, Joel Hunter was a leader in that movement, and many others here, here in Orlando. So that's a good, that's, that's actually quite a good uh, definition of what the emergent church movement is. One of the things they wanted to do from that, from what you heard, is that they wanted to bring all conceivable belief systems under its umbrella. But the important thing was to radically change the way people related to the Bible. The Pope, yes, absolutely. The Pope has signed off on the emergent church movement. In fact, I'll tell you a secret. They are behind it. They are behind it, the Jesuits. We'll talk about the Jesuits at length. Most of this class is going to be focused on those guys. Yes, they are absolutely behind it. And it goes all the way back to a certain council that occurred in the 1500s called... Anyone, anyone knows what great church council occurred in the 1500s? There was a, a, a colossal... Council. It took 18 years to come to a conclusion. In the 1500s, started in 1546, ended somewhere in 1568 or something. The Council of Trent happened in Trent. Now, it was the Council of Trent 
that the groundwork for all that we're seeing in the world today, even what's going to happen on Wednesday, it was at the Council of Trent that the framework for where we are today was established. The Council of Trent gave us, in 1776, the Illuminati, which lasted 10 years. And that's all they needed, just 10 years. Because in that 10-year period, they sunk their claws deep into the fabric of Western civilization. And I mean in, I mean in European Western civilization. And in those 10 years, they sunk their claws deeply into the fledgling American civilization to ensure that they would have an important role in its existence. And they did. 1546, somewhere there, you might want to check me on that date. Maybe uh, I'll, keep, I'll, keep, uh, I'll keep Mr. Lopez busy. Council of Trent, could you give, give me the date on that? I need to have a laptop. Come right on. Yes, and we'll get to the relevancy. The relevancy is there. We'll get to that in a moment. All right, let's, let's finish up with this particular viewpoint that I really, really have a problem with quite a bit. Listen, I, I generate a lot of uh, disdain for certain things in Christianity because it really deep, deeply hurts me to see Christians going after things that are destructive. And I get worked up about the ones that are really, really bad, such as this one. This gives us abortion as being acceptable. Yes? No, so all right, my, my dates were off. All right. So let's get on now with this. This is the one I'm most concerned about. This is the one I have, uh, how should I say it? Consternation about? Yeah. This is a troubling viewpoint. This is the most misleading as it relates to true Bible believing Christians. The futuristic view. This one is directly and, 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 and absolutely tethered to the Jesuit movement. And we can trace it. And that's what we're going to do tonight in discussion. That's what I'm going to do tonight. We can, we, can, we, can, we can identify its connection to the Jesuit movement. And it's very vivid. And so we'll talk about that here now. Established at the Council of Trent, I have 1547. So somebody's wrong. And, and uh, so that's what, yeah, okay. All right. I, I, I have 1547. I would have gotten that from uh, another source. All right. So whatever. So 1547, I have here to 1563. How many years is that? If you have more than 10 fingers. How many years? 16 years, yeah. All right, so Council of Trent. The view was established at that particular council. Now let's talk about the Council of Trent as Chris, as Chris led us to consider. Why did the Council of Trent come into existence? They hadn't had church councils before this, or the Vatican hadn't had church councils for at least 700 years. Suddenly, after approximately 700 years, they're having a, a very important church council went on for 16 years. Quite. Right. Right. Martin Luther challenged the very fabric of Catholicism when he nailed that thesis on the wall of that cathedral. And what was the essence of the essay? What was, what was? That's right. You're not justified. You're not justified. You're not justified by works, the catechism. You're justified by your faith. And this was Martin Luther's contention. And he was right. Of course he was right. He was biblical. Very vivid in the Bible. Book of Romans uh, vividly states it twice. And in the book of Galatians. And conceptually, it's throughout the Bible. You're justified by your 
excuse me, by your faith and not by your works. So what's the connection between justification and salvation? Why do we say you're saved by, by faith? That comes from, from Ephesians chapter 2, by the way, which is not what it says. It says you're saved by grace and that by faith. All right. So the salvation that we experience is really a, 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 a product of God's grace, but it has to be initiated in our faith. But when it says salvation, how do we, how do we arrive at salvation from the word justification? Because that's what Paul said, you're justified by faith. How do we arrive at salvation from justification? I'll share that with you now. When I believed God, or whenever I believe God, I become justified by my, by my belief, by my faith. Whatever the issue is. If I'm saying, God, give me a word for my, 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 my children, for each of them. Give me a word of faith for them. And he does, and I believe him, justified. Every word of faith received and embraced by the believer adds justification to his existence. He becomes justified every word of faith. Abraham believed God about his descendants, and he became justified, right? That simple. That wasn't salvation necessarily. So how does salvation and justification connect? All right. So God provided atonement. He provided complete and absolute atonement at the cross. Jesus went to the cross by faith. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 5 and 3 and 5. By his own faith applied to his actions, he provided justification for all. But Paul also said he became the justifier. And that's the essence of who the Lamb of God is. The one who justifies. I can't justify anyone. I can have justification. By my faith, I can be justified. Made righteous. Same word. But me, I can never be one who justifies. Only Jesus can be the justifier. Okay? That's what Paul said. And we'll study that later on in the book of Romans. So, Jesus, by his own faith, became the justifier. And because he carried out his act of faith and was justified, in that faith, I can be justified. And what I mean by that is, if I look to the cross for my atonement, he provided it, he became the justifier, he himself became just by his own faith. So in order for him to become the justifier, he had to execute his own faith. And he did that. From the Mount, the, from the Mount uh, of Transfiguration all the way to Galgata, he walked out his word of faith. What did he hear on the Mount of Transfiguration? What was the word that God sent through Moses and Elijah? Go to Jerusalem and become the Lamb of God. That was the word of faith that he received from God. And what did he do? Immediately, he set his face towards Jerusalem, and he did not miss a step. He, he, he went up to Golgotha and became the Lamb of God. Perfect obedience, perfect faith, perfectly justified, and the justifier. So because he was just, because he was faithful in his word of faith, he provided for us justification. So I look to Golgotha, I look to the cross, the blood of Jesus, I apply, well, God applied it, but I, by faith, apply that in my life, by faith, and I become justified. My sins are removed. And the essence of my justification becomes what God did with his son on the cross. That he provided that I would be completely forgiven. My sins will be washed away. I have to believe it. I have to know it beyond belief. I have to know it. I have to have that conviction, that knowing that my sins are removed. How many Christians do you think carry themselves around? condemned inwardly, not knowing that their sins are, act are actually removed. You think there's a few that are not fully, truly forgiven? 
in, their, in themselves. They're, con they're condemned in themselves. How many Christians are in such a place? Many. You see, being justified by faith in the cross, in the blood of Jesus, leads to that place of salvation because once we are justified, we can be reconciled to God. And having been reconciled, Paul will tell us, we will be saved. We will have salvation because of that reconciliation process that comes from being justified. So I'm justified, fully justified, because I am convinced that my sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. I know it. Jesus went to the cross, provided that for me. He is the justifier, the one who justifies. And I am justified by what he has accomplished by faith. Now, I have to stay in that place, right? I, can't, I cannot enter into sin and then become condemned and believe that I'm justified or have the faith that I'm justified. You follow me? So, yes, I can walk in, 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 in faith about my position with God, my salvation, my justification for 10 years and suddenly find myself in a place of deep sin and never return to the cross. And what happens? If I'm in sin and I'm condemned and I am not standing in faith that I am forgiven, if I never return to the cross, what happens? I die in the state of being unjustified. I'm not reconciled to God. Even though I did that 20 years before, you see? So the cross in that sense is a place that we should return to every time we recognize error in our lives. That's where we go. Because he is the one who justifies. Only he can justify. So salvation is really justification. So we're saved by... This is, this is, this is what Martin Luther wanted us to know. We're saved by faith. Justified is actually the concept that he was considering. Not by works. Good works will never get you justified or reconciled to God. You can do good works all day long. It will not justify you unless there is faith applied. All right? So this is the concept trend. Following this essay that, that Martin Luther did and he put on the wall of the cathedral, the Roman Catholic world was tossed into an upheaval. People were coming out of the system. People were challenging the system. Whole new church movements were being formed, completely, completely hostile to the Roman Catholic system. And this was a great concern. Added to this, the Roman Catholics were losing their Jews. Their Jews. Jews were fleeing Europe in large numbers because of the Inquisition, because of the expulsion edict. Right? You can't pass an edict to expel people, have them leave, and then get upset. But that's what they did. And so part of the Council of Trent was also to deal with the Jews that were fleeing Europe and going to the New World, the Caribbean, most of many of them, and to the Far East, Turkey and the land of Israel, Egypt, and, and so on. So the Council of Trent was really about doctrine, but also about how to put, it, put together an order that will deal with these issues. Now, in 15... 35, the Jesuit order came into existence in 1535. A certain, a certain uh, uh, a Dominican monk, a, a theologian, a scholar by the name of, uh, of Ignatius de la Royal, he formed the Jesuit order. Together with others, of course, they put together this cabal within the, within the Roman Catholic system. They were, they were Dominican monks, and they formed this order called the Jesuits, the Brotherhood of Christ, Jesuits. Now, from its very conception, Ignatius de la Hoyal was an occultist. He was a cabalist. He, he, was, he was initially a, a young Jewish lad who was taken away from his parents, and forcibly converted and taken into the Dominican order. The Dominican order was the order where most of the forced, forcibly converted Jews went to. 
Now, Ignatius de la Royale had access to Kabbalic insight, which is occultic insight. And he fused, he, he created a fusion of, of, of Christian doctrine or Christian concepts with Kabbalic concepts. Ignatius de la Royale was a, a, a Kabbalist. And he is the person that formed the Jesuit order. And that's why there's so much intrigue and occultism wrapped up in the Jesuit order. If you do any research about the Jesuits, you would find out that they have 96 degrees in their order. Most secret societies has 30, 33 or something. They have 96 degrees of accomplishment or, or stratas that you can go to in the Jesuit order. It was put together very much, it's a secret society, it was put, it was put together very much like a, a secret order. It is a secret order. They were responsible again for the Illuminati. A certain Jesuit by the name of Adam Weishaupt. Adam Weishaupt was the one who formed the Illuminati, of course, together with the help from some friends, <laughs> the Rothschilds and others who were complicit to the Jesuit order. So you see, the Jesuit order is, is brimming and, and chuck pack with all sorts of occultic intrigue. The very founder, again, of the Jesuit order, Ignatius de la Royale, was an occultist, a Kabbalist. So that's 1535, it came into existence. It took them from 1535 to 1547, 12 years, to put together the Council of Trent. 12 years, these great minds sat around and outlined what they will do at the Council of Trent, and they did every bit of it. So the, the futuristic view now comes into play. A certain Jesuit scholar, teacher, theologian by the name of Francisco Rivera, he introduced the concept of interpreting the book of Revelation from a purely futuristic view. Brilliant, brilliant response to the Protestants because the Protestants were saying, you, Roman Catholic world, you are the Antichrist system. That's what the Protestants were saying. And the Protestants were, they, they, they've been saying that for at least 500 years before. But now they had something to stand on because there was a breakaway from the Roman Catholic system. So now they became emboldened by the breakaway and now all of these different sects of, of Christians became Protestants and now they're, 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 they're mounting an offense against the Roman Catholic system saying that you are the Antichrist system and the Pope is the Antichrist, even though I don't believe that. Certainly he is an Antichrist, he's not the Antichrist. So, so, so in response to that, we have the Council of Trent. How do we deal with this movement that's pointing a finger at us? They began to feel a little exposed, you see. <laughs> now, one of the things that Ignatius de la Royale did is the order of the Jesuits, the Brotherhood of Christ, they, they call it, was to function subversively. There would be a hidden a mass hidden order below the front movement of the Roman Catholic system. And that there would be a leader in this hidden order and he would be called the Black Pope, the Dark Pope, the Black Pope. And this Black Pope will actually be the, the clout behind the throne. There would be the Pope that's in the light, the conventional Pope, but then there would be the black pope who is an agent of the Jesuits. That began very early, and we can say that Ignatius de la Royale was the first black pope. We have a black pope today that is the white pope. For the first time ever, we have a Jesuit pope. Never before. And when you consider that the conventional pope was literally removed pushed aside so that he can come into that place, it tells us that that was a very planned, a very organized move. The Jesuits, right now the Jesuits have been hidden, dark, 
have been hidden since its conception. Now they're coming wide out open. They, they, they're not hiding anymore. That's why they can be a Jesuit pope. And what is this Jes Jesuit pope doing? What has he been doing since he's been in office? He's promoting every Jesuit initiative, bringing about a world system, fulfilling what Adam Weishaupt, Francisco Rivera, and many others had envisioned. So he died uh, 1591, not a minute too soon. This, this futuristic view, which I'm going to give you details on it here in a moment, was further developed by an uh, uh, English uh, Jesuit now by the name of Robert Bellin, Bellamin, Bellamin. A Jesuit scholar again, uh, 15 to 60, he lived a little past the Council of Trent, but he became the one who promoted the futuristic view beyond Francisco Rivera. We'll talk about what the view is. Established for the purpose of counter-reformation activity. So the futuristic view of the book of Revelation came into existence to contest the, the Protestants and what they were saying. What were the Protestants saying again? Vatican, Holy See, as it's referred to, you are the seat of the Antichrist. You are basically the devil. Here is where I'm going to define for you what the futuristic view is. The position, Revelation chapter 4 to 22, to be fulfilled in the future from the standpoint of the Council of Trent. All of it is to be fulfilled in the future. That none of the book of Revelation had been yet fulfilled. Not even the breaking of the seals or any aspects of the book of Revelation had been fulfilled. And to a certain extent, they were right, correct, to a certain extent. But what they, what they, what they provided for in this, in, this, uh, in this formula, in this context, is that not until Jesus comes will the book of Revelation, chapter 4 to 22, be fulfilled. And that's the essence of the futuristic view. And that's where we get, that's where we get the pre-tribulation theory from. That's where that comes from. That Revelation 4 to 22 is all in the future, but it only begins as Jesus comes. And that the church is raptured, quote-unquote raptured, in Revelation chapter 4. And from that time going forward, the book of Revelation is then complete. So it cannot possibly be in the process of being fulfilled now because Jesus has not yet come. And this is actually the genius of the futuristic view as a tool to deal with what the Protestants were saying. Why? Someone tell me why this is genius. It makes that statement. It makes that statement. If you embrace the futuristic view, it says that we could not possibly be the Antichrist system and the Pope cannot possibly be the Antichrist because Jesus has not yet come. You see that? Now, does, does that sound familiar? That's what many, if not most, Bible prophecy teachers will teach today. Where did it come from? It came from the Council of Trent. It's a Jesuit plot basically a Jesuit plot. So you go to most of your churches that will still today focus on Bible prophecy, and there are many of them. Your fundamental Baptist churches would. Your mainstream Baptist churches will not. <laughs> go to Crossroads. Is it Crossroads? That, you, that were formerly uh, Oviedo Baptists? Yeah, Crossroads. Cross Life. Cross Life. Cross Life. They are the Crossroads. Uh, cross Life. You go to Cross Life. You don't get anything about Bible prophecy. Nothing about the rapture anymore, right? They used to 25 years ago, but that's passé. That's a bygone era. The message has transformed into the liberal type of message, more or less, even though cross-life would be 
more, a little more conservative, or they will give a hint towards being conservative, but they certainly will not touch what they used to teach 25 years ago. But you go to the more fundamental Bible uh, t churches, like the fundamental Baptist churches and so on, which most people would stay clear of because they actually teach the Bible. And this is what you're going to get, the pre-tribulation concept, theory. Sometimes I call it a contraption, the pre-tribulation contraption, because it's very much a house of cards. It's not biblically sound at all. And I'm not surprised because of where it came from. Francisco Rivera and Robert Bellamine pushed this agenda to protect the Vatican so that the Vatican can never be seen as the seat of Antichrist. But they were not really protecting the Vatican. What were they actually protecting? The Jesuits. Because the Jesuit order was the order that was subverting the Roman Catholic Church. It was that order that began to push towards the type of world that we see today. Literally, what we're seeing, the madness that we're seeing in the world today, is the fruit of the Jesuit order. Bearing right before us. Right in our faces. Right now, they're, they're wanting to to indict the president because of an hour-long conversation. And you listen to the conversation, I did, and uh, they're just going through the motions again. It's foolish. The things that they are guilty of, my goodness, what Trump said on the phone cannot even come close to comparing to what they have actually done and some of what they've actually said to incriminate themselves. And they're going to get away with it. Why? Because of, the, because of the subversion of these people, I'm telling you the Jesuits are entrenched in modern civilization. You might think that John Booth actually was acting on his own accord to assassinate Lincoln. You might think that, but that's not true. He was a Jesuit operative. He was. Now that, that's going to require research, but he was. Why, why did Lincoln die from, from this perspective, from this point of view? Why did he die? Why, why was he assassinated by the Jesuits? For a number of reasons, but mainly because he crossed them pretty badly. As an attorney, uh, as a lawyer in, 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 uh, in, in, in uh, Chicago, he really stood against them, and he won a case against them, and it really crossed them badly. But he was pushing for a different type of government than, than what they had envisioned. Because the Jesuits were seeing globalization as their ultimate goal. The South was embracing Europe, the, the British, right? The, the British involvement was a part of what the South was open to. And the South was more open at that time towards internationalism than the North was. Actually, at that time, the North was more nationalistic than the South was. It was, it was only commerce driving it here in the south and, and 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 lincoln interfered with their hopes of global commerce and he had to die it was a jesuit hit now i only said that and that's controversial but i only said that to provoke you to think and to understand how well entrenched the jesuits are in our world today and have been since its formation in 1535 with, with Ignatius de la Hoya. You know, Hillary Clinton had a running mate. What was his name? Can't remember, Evans or something. Evans was his name, uh, whatever. He is the quintessential Georgetown graduate Jesuit. Many of the people that are in our government uh, Georgetown graduates. What's Georgetown? Well, that's the University of the Jesuit Order. That's where they, they mold and shape the minds of these men that are sent out to rule this country. Every, Georgia, every Georgetown graduate is prepped to, to ascend into government, and they're all Jesuits. Now, that, again, is going to require research on your part. All right, we're going to come back to this after the break. Let's come back at 20 after... 
9, and we'll try to get to the end of this discussion. I know I'm throwing out a lot of information, but I want to encourage you to take notes. I'm going to give you this next week. In fact, I'm going to try and copy it now, but I want you to go and do your own research because I can't convince you of any of this without you seeing it yourself. So now let's talk about Revelation chapter 4 to 22 to be fulfilled in the future, which was the main bulk of their conclusion. They concluded many things at the Council of Trent. They had 16 years to do it. But this, as it relates to Bible prophecy, was the most meaningful conclusion. Because it took the Vatican out of the, out of the, out of the, the, the spotlight. They were no longer, according to this, any threat concerning the Antichrist system. And what did that do? In their own minds, it opened the way for them to continue their subversion and their manipulation leading to exactly where we are this day, where we are today. They're coming up. Could you could you get them for us? If they should be complete. Now, what about Revelation chapter four to twenty-two? Why did they choose Revelation chapter four to twenty-two? Because in Revelation chapter four begins the futuristic view of the book of Revelation from John's point in time. So if you consider John, who, who, who was given the revelation, from that time forward, the book of Revelation was all 100% in the future. So let's say that this is John. He had the revelation that came from God. Jesus provided that revelation. It was his to begin with. He had the revelation that came from God. So from that point in time going forward, all the way to today, and this here would represent Thank you. 
One of the church fathers projected that concept that there would be a secret arrival of Jesus where no one Christian doctrine. And they included the whole pre-tribulation rapture contraption in their Bible. And from that point on, the rest is history. And that's how we have the futuristic view that has led to the pre-tribulation view of the Bible. Now I'll ask a question. And it's something that can be researched. How much of evangelical Christianity today believes the pre-tribulation rapture contraption? A lot. It's really placated beyond ever It's wonderful. Why? Because it placates to the flesh. It placates to the self really nicely. It says to the one who is facing a difficult world, and we're facing it right now, we're already in it. It says to that one, oh, don't worry. Not one hair of your head will be lost. You're going to be raptured out of here when things get really bad. That's the essence of the pre-tribulation rapture contraption. And the Western world loves it. The Eastern world and the Middle Eastern world, not so much. Because they have been living in persecution and in tribulation for a long time. So you can't sell the pre-tribulation rapture contraption in the Middle Eastern world, Africa, and in the Far East world. You just can't. It does not fit. In fact, the Chinese of the, fourth, of the 1940s and 50s bought into it. Yes. During World War II, the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture was presented to the Chinese, and they bought it hook, line, and sinker. Now, the Chinese are very, uh, very uh, study-oriented people, very analytic, ana analytic. And when that concept was given to them, they dove right into it. They bought the whole thing. They just, yes, this is going to happen. The rapture is going to happen. It's, World War II is upon us. The Japanese are destroying us. Uh, we have looming possibilities of a, of a, of a communist government, but we're going to be raptured out of this. And they were not. 50 million of them were slaughtered by their own government. After the 1960s, there was no more pre-tribulation rapture belief system in China. Why? For obvious reasons. They saw with their own eyes, they paid with their own blood, the price for believing in the pre-tribulation rapture theory. By the beginning of the 1970s, the Chinese church had, had succumbed. They were weakened. They were downtrodden. They were barely in the faith. Then Corrie Ten Boon, you know Corrie Ten Boon? She went to China to visit the Chinese church to try to understand what was happening. And she was told, well, we believed in the rapture. We believed that it would come and save us. It didn't happen. And that's why there's so much apathy and falling away in the Chinese church. That's what she was told. You know what Cory Ten Boone began to do? She began to dismantle the pre-tribulation rapture contraption. And she began to tell the Chinese Christians, don't look for the rapture, look to Israel. Because when the kingdom comes, it will happen in Israel. That's what Cory Ten Boone began to tell the Chinese believers. Today, the Chinese believers are strong Israel-focused believers. Very strong. We don't know this because the Chinese church is subdued, sub, 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 submerged, subjugated, but they're probably more Zionistic than we are. Now, mark those words because that will come to light at some point in the future that the Chinese church that's underground and subjugated are more Christian, more Israel focused than we are. And there is evidence for it. Because before COVID came on the scene, for at least Chinese Christians had began to become more wealthy and so on, you know, more, more, more capitalism in their, in their economy. And if you had gone to Israel between the years of 2010 to last year, you would see floods of Chinese Christians just loving the land of Israel. Yeah. 
And when you went with us again in 2017, they were all over the place. They were everywhere. Why? Because of Corrie Tim Boone and what she told them. Don't look for the rapture. It's not going to happen like that. Look, for, look to Israel because that's our sign that the kingdom of God is going to be established. She was right. She was absolutely right. Corrie Tim Boone was absolutely right. So then the question is, why did the, the whole Christian world buy into this concept? That this is where Revelation 4 to 22 will be fulfilled only. But what happens here, according to them, we're raptured out of here. Ah. Right? According to them, that's, that's when we're taken out. According to the theory that was projected, presented at the Council of Trent, developed by these men, and then ultimately brought to bear by Emmanuel de la Cunza Diaz. A Moranos. He, he became known as a rabbi before he died. After he left Santiago with his book in one hand, he went to Lima, Peru. He got involved in the Moranos communities of Lima, Peru. And they were all over. If you go to Lima, Peru today, all around that, that mountain of Lima, where Lima, Peru is, you have dotted communities throughout there, and they were all at one point Moranos communities. Lima, Peru is where the auto de fe for all of South America took place. In other words, Lima, Peru is where they burnt Jews to the stake, reverted Jews only. You could have been a Jew. You get slapped around, you get kicked around. But if you were a Christian reverting to Judaism, you were going to die. Lima, Peru was the capital of that. Emmanuel de la Cunza Diaz took his book in one hand, under the disguise of a Moranos rabbi, went to Lima, Peru, and began to interact with the, with the persecuted underground Moranos community, crypto-Jewish community. The word Moranos isn't a good word. So he began to interact with the crypto-Jewish community, and because of his book, they loved his book, by the way. They loved his book because he was projecting that you, crypto-Jews who are Christians and Jewish mixed together, you are the elect. You are the creme de la creme. You are the ones that will be raptured out. That's what the book said. That was the position of the book to a certain extent. So they loved the book. And what else happened? Many of them were discovered because of the book. So Emmanuel de la Cunza Diaz more than likely functioned as a crypto-Jewish rabbi in order to discover the Moranos communities and bring them to trial. Now that's, that cannot be proven. I'm just one person that believed that together with other people. So you see, this man was evil. He was confused, conflicted, a Jesuit operative bringing people to trial, but he was essentially, because of his confusion, his spiritual confusion, he was evil. How can a good tree bring forth good fruit? Uh, how can an evil tree bring forth good fruit? The whole Jesuit order is the plantation of this tree. It's the soil that this tree came from. The Jesuits are pure evil. They gave us the pre-tribulation rapture contraption. It's an evil tree. How can it possibly bear good fruit? It will not. It can only bear evil fruit. And the, 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 con the, 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 the conclusion I have concerning the pre-tribulation rapture is it is an evil fruit because it gives a sense of false security. It gives a sense that, oh, I don't have to worry about anything. I'm going to be raptured out of here. I don't have to engage my Christianity. I don't have to be fervent and be watchful at this time because when it happens, I'm gone. The pre-tribulation rapture contraption. So naturally, I am a post-tribulationalist. All right? I'm a post-tribulationist, meaning that I am believing and I'm teaching that the tribulation, that the tribulation will occur, the elect will exist during the tribulation here on earth, and at the end of the tribulation period, will the elect be taken up? But we're not being taken up to off to be in the stars somewhere, in the, in the, in the heavens somewhere. 
We're taking up, but we're coming with him because that's what he's doing. He's coming. I'm a post-tribulationalist because I read Matthew chapter 24, and I believe it. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. This, this one chapter, in fact, just about seven or eight verses in this one chapter, dispels completely the pre-tribulation contraption. Just one little block of Matthew chapter 24 just completely undermines it entirely. Now, Matthew chapter 24 and 25 is referred to as the Olivet Discourse. This is Jesus' power-packed message concerning Bible prophecy. He gave the message on the Mount of Olives, the same place that he would ascend from and descend to. So he stood there right on that mountain and gave this incredible message about Bible prophecy. I'm just going to pick it up in verse 21. No, let's back up some more. Why not? Mm -hmm. In verse 9, he starts by saying, well, he, he introduces here the idea of tribulation. He says, he says then, they, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Goes on to say, at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because lawlessness will increase, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. So what can we take from what he's saying here? Just, just what he's saying right here. There's coming a, a period of tribulation. Betrayal, falling away, persecution. People will be killed because of his name. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now, according to the pre-tribulation rapture contraption, we're not going to experience any persecution, any tribulation. Let's pick it up in verse 21. For then, now he's speaking of a different time, for then there will be great tribulation. He spoke of tribulation that will come before, bad enough, now he's talking about great tribulation, such as not such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. What does that imply? That the elect are here. The, this this period of great tribulation is so dramatic, so intense that. Had it not been for the elect, no life would be preserved. It says clearly that the elect are here and they are, and they are enduring here. The elect, the elect is sort of the, 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 the stopping agent, the agent that's holding back complete destruction in the earth. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is Christ, or there he is, do not believe them. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. So the elect are those who are, we would say, baptized in the Holy Spirit, have insight in the Holy Spirit, that should not be deceived. But we can be deceived if... It's possible for us to be deceived. Right. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will be. He's, he's just saying, you're going to know when I come. There's not going to be a mystery. You're going to know when I come. Now, it goes on. Verse 29. We're going to read 29 to 31 now. This is where he makes it very clear when we would be raptured. What do we know so far? 
the elect will be in the earth. We will endure. Because we're in the earth, God's going to hold back the complete destruction that can come upon humanity. But immediately after the tribulation, what tribulation? Well, the great tribulation. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens, of the heavens will be shaken. This is the great tribulation. This is the final trumpet. This is when everything just comes apart. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why? Because they see him. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. That's where Emmanuel de la Cunza got the title of his book from. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the, four, from the four winds from one end of the sky to the next. So you follow this carefully. He comes. Everyone will see him. He will then send his angels out to, to the seventh trumpet, the final trumpet, the great trumpet will sound. The dead will raise and there will be the assembly of the elect. They, what are the angels doing? They're sounding the trumpets. So he sends his angels to sound that, that final trumpet, and that's the rapture of the church. This is where the rapture actually occurs. At the end of the tribulation. It's pretty clear. So that's my text for Bible prophecy. According to that text, it came straight from the mouth of Jesus on the Mount of Olives, the most relevant spot in all the world as it relates to Bible prophecy, why does the Mount of Olives uh, represent the most relevant spot in all the world for Bible prophecy? Because that's where he's returning to. And that's where he's going to reign from. And he spoke this prophecy right there. I believe this prophecy. I believe that there's going to be tribulation and great tribulation. Horrible tribulation will come upon humanity. The stars will fall from the sky. Incredible things will happen. And then... All, all the earth will see his appearance, and then we'll be raptured, and we'll be gathered to be with him. That's what I believe. There's no place in my belief system for what these guys have been working on for 500 years, because it's not real. According to that system, next week we will look at the, the Zemach view, but according to, the, according to that system... This period of time, from the time of the revelation, from when the revelation was given, to this point, when the church is raptured, none of the book of Revelation is fulfilled. Only in this short period of time, Revelation 4 to 22 will be fulfilled. It's absurd. It's absurd. According to the, 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 the next view, which is, The historic view, and we don't have time to get into it tonight, we will next week. According to our understanding, our view, the book of Revelation actually begins to fulfill, to be fulfilled at the time that John was given the revelation and even before the time that John was given the revelation. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 goes back to the birth of Jesus. You see that? It does go back to the birth of Jesus, and we will study that when we get to Revelation chapter 12. So, the book of Revelation, on a linear, a linear basis, a, a time linear basis, and it had been, it's, it's been in the process of being fulfilled. In fact, what I would say about this timeline as it relates to the book of Revelation is that this line right here, which is, which is not realistic, might be the actual time when the Great Tribulation begins. But we're not going to be raptured out of here. It could be that time. At any rate... 
from the from the time according to the, according to the historic view from the time that John received the revelation all the way up to a certain point we don't know if that point is here or somewhere else it could be any of these the sixth seal and we'll study this is broken now strictly speaking according to what we believe the sixth seal is already broken in that place outside of space and time in heaven and next week we'll discuss this what I mean by that is this every seal that's broken and there are seven seals that we're going to look at every seal that's broken Jesus broke them at one time at the very time that he ascended to be in, in the presence of God, at the right hand of God, he was given the scroll, and he began breaking the seals. Remember what John said, he wept, because no one was found worthy to break the seals and to open the book. And the angel said, and, and the angel said don't weep, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he was found worthy to open the book and break its seals. He started breaking the seals. And John saw the effects of each seal that was broken. So, in terms of our space-time reference, it happened then. Jesus, Jesus ah, broke the seals. And as he broke the seals, each one of the effects of the seals began to play out on this lineal timeline. And we'll see that when we begin to study the breaking of the seals. Wars, conquerings, and farming, and play. all these things began to happen as a result of Jesus breaking the seals and revealing it to John. Every seal brought about a certain effect in this lineal timeline. The one effect that we don't have, we have not seen, the only one, really, or two, uh, that we have not seen, the effects of the breaking of the seals, is the sixth and the seventh seal. We do not see the effects of the breaking of these seals. That tells us that we're yet to see the effect of it, of them. When the seventh seal is broken, there's quiet in heaven for half an hour. Why? Because the hush is because of what is about to come. The great tribulation, the trumpets, the trumpets. And then on top of the trumpets, we have the three woes that comes, the seventh, sixth, and the fifth trumpet. The three woes are basically saying things are really going to get bad now. Now, all of these things we have not experienced yet. The trumpets, the seventh, the seventh seal being broken, or the sixth seal. The sixth seal is a global cataclysmic event, an earthquake that will cause mountains to crumble into the seas. Cities will disappear. According to the breaking, according to what we see with when the sixth seal is broken, the sky will will fold up like a scroll as a result of this earthquake. You know, and we'll talk about this more next week. Uh, I'll just we'll just close with this: the earthquake that we see in Revelation uh, chapter eight, that that's the sixth seal, is pointing to an earthquake that seismologists and geologists are preparing for. <laughs> About 10 years ago, after that big earthquake in Japan, and after considering what was happening around the Pacific belt, the belt of fire, the rim of fire, you know, plate tectonics, they, they're seeing that something is happening in the Pacific. Uh, plate tectonics, the plates are moving so rapidly and so erratically, they're creating thousands of earthquakes. Thousands of earthquakes. By the way, Jesus said, what about earthquakes? That they would increase and they would be they would be mega earthquakes, which is what we're seeing today. Well, the sixth seal speaks of an earthquake that will be so strong, like I said, mountains will disappear, cities will will cease to be, the sky will fold wide open. Seismologists and geologists are talking about such an earthquake that it's inevitable, it's gonna happen. And they're saying it's gonna be a 10.5 or, or an eleven on the Richter scale, something that they've never even thought about happening before. They used to say a 10 
on the rectus scale is impossible. Never will it happen. Now they're talking about 10.5, a possible 11 on the Richter scale. And they're preparing for it because they're seeing the makings of such an earthquake. And I saw a documentary one time, they speculate about what will happen, for instance, if something like that were to happen in this country, Yellowstone Park, that area, the, the San Andrea Fault, for instance. If there was an 11 point something on the Richter scale, what would happen there? And then what they basically said is that that, ha that half of California that's divided by the San Andrea Fault will simply slip into the ocean. The mountains will, according to, according to what we see with the breaking of the Sixth Seal, it will literally be fulfilled. San Francisco, Los Angeles, all those cities on the coast will simply cease to be. And they said something that was very interesting. They said that the effect of such a thing will cause the caldera of Yellowstone to, er to, to erupt. And they said, based on all that seismic activity, they said that the sky will unfold because of the intense power that, that it will generate. The sky will literally open up. They said it. And that's exactly what we're going to see next week when the sixth seal is broken. So that hasn't happened yet. We've never seen anything like that. But we've seen the effects of all the other seals that were broken before it. From the, from the beginning of this linear timeline, we've seen the effects. So we're waiting on that one, that one seal, which is broken, but we're waiting on the effects of it. When that happens, know for sure that the Great Tribulation has begun. That the Great Tribulation period has begun. I will say to you that Emmanuel de la Cunza Diaz was possibly right. He said 49 days. Who knows? It could be 49 hours. We don't know how long that period would be. It would be significant in terms of its destructiveness. What God will do when that final, when that final set of judgment comes upon us. The sixth trumpet. So, this is, this is very shaky, well, shaky, shaking, powerful stuff that we're going to be getting into. And, and, and if, if, if I'm correct, if we are correct, we're entering into that period now where, where quite likely we will see the, break, the effects of the breaking of the sixth seal. It's going to conjoin with, there's going to be a conjunction with the beast government. We're going to see that real clearly how during the time of the beast government is when this earthquake will occur. So here we are, we're seeing the increase, the increasing of earthquakes, powerful earthquakes. Geologists and seismologists are telling us that there's a big one coming. And when it comes, we ought to be ready. And they're speculating it's going to happen in this, this continent, California. And, and the, the caldera of, uh, like I said, the caldera of Yellowstone is going to erupt. Who knows? Do we understand what that caldera is? How massive it is? It's, it's a mega super volcano. And, and they're speculating that when it goes, literally one third of this country is up in smoke. That's what they're considering right now. Well, Florida is going to be affected really adversely. So, so but listen, when that happens, you're not going to be safe in Siberia. The whole world is sent into an incredible tailspin when that happens. Nevertheless, we don't look forward to it, but it's, it's what God is doing. It's part of the process that brings us to this period when Jesus comes. So the, the important thing for us to understand is that we're going to look at the book of Revelation from the historic viewpoint. We're not going to accept the, 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 the futuristic view. It is faulty. It is dangerous. It has misled many Christians to believe in something that's not real and to their own demise. How many Christians are out there saying, well, I don't have to worry about anything. I'm going to be raptured out of here. I don't have to you know, tighten my belt. I don't have to be accountable, responsible, because I'm going to be raptured out of here. How many? Many. So it's dangerous. 
Emmanuel de la Cunza Diaz did a horrible thing. Now, his motives, I believe, were not pure. And I don't think he knew the full effect of what he would do with his writings. The McDonald clan furthered it, and they're more responsible than he was. And then, of course, the other writers and teachers that came after the McDonald clan, they became more responsible. And then ultimately, you have the Moody Bible Institute, who is grossly more responsible for this heresy. And then you have Hal Lindsley and the others like him that are promoting this thing. They are grossly, grossly more accountable and responsible for this heresy. And they ought to repent. Anyway, I hate to end on such a negative note, but that's where we are. The good news is that he's coming, and he's coming to establish the kingdom of God. <laughs>